Welcome to Reform Perspective. I am Josiah Espinoza. And I am Princess Espinoza. And today we'll be talking about compatibilism. Now, I know there's different points of views out there. There's um, the, the more patriarchal view of the role of men and women in, in the home. That is that they believe that the man has ultimate authority um, and that if their wife has some kind of opinion or some kind of point of view, that it doesn't really matter. That the man is the ultimate leader and whatever the man says goes. And then we have the opposite view on the other side, which is the egalitarian view, which says that um, men and women are both equal and everything that a woman is uh, everything that a man can do, a woman is just as capable of doing. So if a man is able to lead a home and to shepherd a congregation, then a woman is just as able to do those things. Um, but we hold a view of compatibilism where we believe that both me and my wife are equal in value. Um, n neither one of us is more um, supreme to the other person. Um, but we do recognize that we both have roles in our home. And I think we both believe that the scriptures talk about that. Um, even from the beginning of creation, right? Yes. I mean, so let's talk just a little bit about the beginning of creation. Um, when God created the heavens and the earth, he created um, on the sixth day humanity. He created man and he created women male and female both of them he created in his image which means that both of them bear the image of god right absolutely and so bearing this in mind does this mean that from the very beginning god intended for men and women to do exactly the same thing is that what god's intention was was it that man and woman were capable of doing the exact same thing as the other person or did God have a specific design behind the formation of the male position and the formation of the female position was God's intention always for men and, wo and women men and women to be equal in everything or did God have a specific intention in creating men and women with specific roles. That's usually the question that's brought up. Um, so what do you think? I think that, yes, there are times where we can help each other in doing the role of one another, but ultimately God has made us to do specific roles. He made us completely different. He made us emotionally different, physically different, and mentally different there are things that men can do that is more difficult for women and there's things that women can do and is more difficult for men but that's just the way god has created us to be able to help one another come together and be a team absolutely and um mm -hmm. i think uh if we go to the scripture in genesis chapter one um starting at verse 26 this is when on the sixth day when he starts creating humanity he says, then God said, let us make man. That word man doesn't mean just men. It means humanity. It's a word for humanity. Let's make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him Male and female, he created them, okay? So both of us were both created in the image of God. Mm -hmm. Both of us have specific attributes as a man and as a woman. We have specific attributes that reflect the character and the nature of God. Yes. yes. Yep. And God honors when men are manly and when women are feminine. Absolutely. And we also see that also that when he created man, um, he created man with an intention to rule over um, the earth, to rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth or every creeping thing on the earth. That's Genesis chapter 1, right? 
And he goes on to say, And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath, I have given every green plant for food. And so it was. And God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. I know I said er earlier it was the sixth day he created man, but it's the fifth day. Um, but I, I want us to pay attention that when God created humanity, in Genesis chapter 1, he created humanity. He created them male and female. Mm -hmm. That's chapter 1. And he created them to have dominion over the earth, over the animals, over the livestock. They were created specifically to tend to the things on this earth. Yes. Right? Okay. Is there anything you want to add to this? No. Okay. So let's continue. In chapter 2 of Genesis, mm -hmm. it goes more into depth on the creation and the purposes and the designs of men and women. Okay. Now, it says... Um, Let's just start at verse uh, 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plants of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land that was watering the whole face of the ground. So... Then the Lord God formed the man out of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. So, in Genesis chapter 1, we see God's creative design in making man to um, tend to the, to the earth and to the animals yes. and to have dominion over it. Mm -hmm. And here in chapter 2, we see now again a, a different perspective on the specific creation of men and women mm -hmm. he created man first yes right and when he created man he formed him out of the dust of the ground yeah okay verse 8 not not not, not that man humanity but rather man adam right yes okay and the lord god planted a garden in the eden in eden in the east and there he put the man whom he had formed so it's just right now it's just adam right yeah. okay Verse 9, And out of the ground the Lord made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So before Eve, Eve was created, man, Adam, is in the garden. Uh -huh. He's by himself. Yeah. There's the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life in the midst of the garden. Yeah. Adam is by himself. It goes on to talk about the rivers that are flowing through you, um, the different rivers and in different golds and talking about the different uh, materials that come out of the ground like mm -hmm. uh, onyx and the stones and and how God created the natural river system to kind of basically keep the garden lush yeah. for Adam. Now we get into verse 15. The Lord God took the man from took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work and to keep it. So he's working by himself, right? Yeah. And the Lord commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So the command was given to Adam, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. This is because this is part of the reason I think some people start to misunderstand things is Adam was the head of, he was the representative of all humanity. Yeah. There's something called federal headship where we believe that Adam as being the first human being created in this world um, represented all of humanity because out of him, the whole earth is now present today. Yeah. Okay. And he's by himself and he's working in the midst and God is commanding Adam not to eat of the tree, right? Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. We're on the same track. Uh, the reason I'm talking so much, yeah, I'm going to get my wife involved here real quick. We're just going to establish the foundation of this. So then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper 
fit for him, right? Yes. Okay. Now, what does that mean to be a helper fit for him? In that case, I think it would be whatever the Lord has commanded him to do as of that point, she was supposed to come alongside of him and help him. So if it came down to helping tend to the garden, she was there to help him tend to the garden. That doesn't mean that Eve was weak or she was feeble or that she wasn't intelligent or that she didn't have the ability to do those things, Mm -hmm. but rather we recognize that the role that God gave to Adam was specifically for Adam. The command was to Adam. The creation that um, God made for the earth was given over to Adam. Mm -hmm. And then God said, you know what? I think he needs a helper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what does he do? He makes Eve. Yeah. And he calls her woman. Why? Mm -hmm. Because he brought her out from man Uh right yes does that mean man is over the wife um in authority i don't think in i mean in some ways i think it is because ultimately god is putting the responsibility on adam but he's making this woman to come and help him so that way, when God says, what have you done with all this responsibility? He can say, look at what I've done. And my wife has helped me in this. Right. So I, I think what you said is important. Um, you said not not in the sense that um, Adam is supreme to her. No, not that in the sense that Adam is more important or that mm-hmm. he's more closer to the image of God. No, they're both no. made in the image of God. Absolutely. But rather, we recognize that there is some kind of authority given to Adam and that Eve was supposed to come alongside of him to help him. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. So the responsibility was not given originally to both Adam and Eve. No. It was given primarily to Adam. Mm -hmm. Then Eve came along and uh, was supposed to help him. Yes. Now we get into the fall and i think this is where most people misunderstand because we want to assume that it was eve's fault but i am of the mind to say that it was adam's fault (laughs) and i think it's scriptural because yeah um, even in the new testament in the book of romans paul wants to say that all the responsibility of the fall was on adam Mm mm-hmm even though in First Timothy he does recognize that the woman was the one who was ultimately tempted. Yeah. And ultimately the one who originally disobeyed the commandment of God. Mm-hmm. But again, that doesn't make woman less um, valuable mm-hmm. or less responsible. responsible or not even that, um, as less of a human. Because... Mm-hmm. We want to. Uh, I know. I hear a lot of people say this: is that um, they want to say that because we're compatibilists, that somehow I belittle you as a person, right? Mm-hmm. That somehow um, I see myself as superior to you mm-hmm. because we recognize that there's a, an authority structure that God has designed in the man and the woman mm-hmm. since the time of creation, which we just clearly saw in Genesis mm-hmm. two. We saw this. Um, and then they point to scriptures, um, like, for example, um, in the New Testament, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, a lot of people point to this text and say, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. And then they want to see, you see that verse right there trumps any concept of women not being able to be just as authoritative as men. In the church, they can be elders, they can be pastors, and yet there are several verses in other parts of the New Testament um, that give credence to the idea that, well, God designed different roles for men and women, both in the home and in the church. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so once we get to the fall, we see that, yes, the woman is the one who is tempted versus one through um, one through three, we see the woman who was tempted. She is the one 
who ultimately first partakes of the fruit. She is the one who ultimately um, sees the fruit and says it's good in verse 5. Um, in verse 6, excuse me, it says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, right? Yes. So we recognize that the woman was there, but I... I Point this out every single time to people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> every single time. It says, And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. Yes. And he ate. So it's Absolutely. not so it's not like Adam was like miles away from her and she was just by himself and then she ran through the Garden of Eden to find him, looking mm -hmm. for him and said, Look, I just bit this. Mm -hmm. I want some of this. Yeah. I ate some of this. How about you have some? No, Adam was right there. When all of this was going down, right? Uh, yeah. Yep. So, yes, it was her responsibility. I assume she knew what responsibilities he was to attend to, and that was one of them, to not eat from that tree. And yes, she did eat it, and it is her responsibility, but he was there with her. He was standing right there. He saw her eat it. And instead of telling her, no, what are you doing? You are being disobedient right now. He approved and he partook of that. And ultimately, he was held responsible because even though she was the helper and she came alongside of him, he was still responsible to oversee everything in that garden. And she was one of them. She was one of the people or the only person that he had to look over. He had to protect. And he failed her by not doing that. Yeah, and that's, I think that's an important thing what you just said is he failed yes. her. She didn't fail him. He mm -hmm. failed her. He was supposed to take responsibility. He was supposed to lead her with strong arms. He was supposed to be the one to say like no babe don't do that <laughs> yeah <laughs> maybe not in that exact language but <laughs> you know what i mean and th that's why i think paul recognizes that death came through adam mm -hmm. because even though it was yeah okay eve was the one that kind of um originally was the one who partook of the fruit first but we also recognize that adam was there present with her he's the one who ultimately was uh, originally commanded not to partake of the tree yeah. of good and evil. He was the one who was ultimately given the authority to tend to the garden, which means he was also supposed to tend to Eve. Absolutely. Because um, um, she was also a part of the creation. Mm -hmm. And it's it's one of those things where it's the c compatibility comes in. She tends to him by helping him. And in this case, he was supposed to tend to her by protecting her, by guiding her, and mm. he did not do that. Mm. Yeah, that's that's a beautiful thing to say. I think that's absolutely right. And, but yet, there was, as a result of that, the fall. Absolutely. Right? Okay. And because of this fall, there were some consequences both for men and for women. Uh -huh. In verse 16, it says, to the woman, he said, this is the punishment that he's given to the serpent, to the woman, and to Adam um, as a result of their disobedience. And I want you to, you see the difference between um, the oh, woman's uh -huh. discipline and the man's discipline. Yes. The woman gets one verse, the man gets three verses. <laughs> so um, the discipline for the man is harsher because he was ultimately responsible. And the discipline for the woman is exactly um, what she did to uh, to try to dismantle basically what God had designed from the beginning. Yeah. Verse 16, it says, To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In mm -hmm. pain, you shall bring forth children. And I think I've heard Matt Chandler say this about his wife, is that Matt Chandler believes that his wife says, that the epidural is God's way of redeeming this <laughs> punishment right here. But Absolutely. E but even then, even then, you know, there's still pain involved. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you have had you've had three of your own kids, babe. So, you know exactly. What <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I think every every married man who has seen his wife give birth knows what kind of pain she goes through. Mm -hmm. And so, the the reason I point this out is because when people point to Galatians chapter three verse twenty eight when he says there is neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free nor male nor female, but you are all one in Christ, they assume that that means that Jesus, when Jesus died, he demolished um, this this concept of men being over women and men having different roles than women and that women are now able to partake in the roles of mm -hmm. men but that's not what the that's crucifixion was for because guess what even though christ is crucified you're still having pain in childbirth absolutely absolutely the the second thing is your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Mm -hmm. And I think we've already established that that hasn't changed. No. Nope. Like nope. that was originally designed. Uh huh. The problem is when the fall happened, women, for the most part, Eve was probably already experiencing in her own heart, in her own mind, the wanting to overthrow her husband's authority. Yeah. That is the result of the fall. Because. Mm -hmm. In perfect creation, in the perfect unity of Adam and Eve before the fall, she was still under that command. Absolutely. She was under that command, but there was no sin. So she was like, hey, I'm, I'm satisfied in the role that I have been given, uh -huh. um, designed by God to be the helper of my husband. Yeah. And absolutely, and at that moment, she might not felt the need to overpower her husband, but in the fall of man, God knew that because sin had come into this world now, that women were going to want to overpower their husbands. So he made that um, one of his um, commandments or one of his punishments for her is that the man was going to be above her and that she was going to ultimately have to come to man and be under their authority yeah and the next portion jesus or god excuse me um was saying in verse 17 and to adam he says because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which i commanded you commanded you you know, recognize that god makes it personal on adam i commanded you you listen to your wife you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. And this is the reality of of men now, is that we have to work. Mm -hmm. So it's n when a man goes to work and provides for his family, he is not trying to say that the woman is less um, essential to the family because she doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But rather, be when he goes to work, he is actually partaking of the fall. Yeah. Like he is actually obeying the voice of God after the fall. This is this is part of the curse of the fall. Mm -hmm. Thorns and thistles I shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall, you shall return. And so we have here... Um, I think from the very beginning of the establishment of both Adam and Eve's roles, uh -huh. even before the fall, even at the time of creation, we have the two roles established by God. Man was supposed to um, tend to his wife, have authority over all of creation to include his created wife. Uh -huh. That doesn't mean that Adam is a greater being than her. That somehow he is closer to the image of God than her. Yeah. They are both made in the image of God. Male and female, he made them. That's Genesis chapter 1. But we also recognize that from the very beginning, God um, established different roles. Mm -hmm. Now, what we don't want to say is that when Jesus died, he didn't change any of the dynamics of the marriage. <laughs> we don't want to say that. If anything, we want to say that truly and honestly... Christians are supposed to be partaking of what a true marriage is supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. 
if in reality Jesus did die on the cross to redeem the fall, mm -hmm. then that means we are supposed to go back to that image of Adam and, and Eve before the fall yeah, and mimic that mm -hmm. by the power of the Spirit, by faith, through grace. And we have scripture verses that kind of guide us into how we are to live. Yeah. And so it says here in verse in, in Ephesians chapter 5, I'm going to start at verse 21 because it kind of sets the, found, the foundation for the previous texts. But in verse 21 it says, Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. I know this is talking about the whole church, but then I think Paul wants to logically um, bring that same statement into verses 22. Uh -huh. Uh, all the way through to the end of chapter 5 when he starts talking about wives and husbands being submissive. Because in reality, husbands and wives are supposed to submit to one another mm -hmm. in a sense while still rec recognizing and maintaining uh, the design of men and women's roles in the family. Mm -hmm. So it says here in verse 22, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Actually, you know what? You read verses 22 through 24. Okay. So it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, remember, it says, as to the Lord. Remember that. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its savior now as the church submits to christ so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands now does that mean that by submitting you are becoming less of a person no so what does that mean to submit to your husband because i, th I think a lot of the times when women hear this they automatically want that there's that fall again, that sin nature. They want to say, I'm not going to submit to my husband. What are you talking about? I'm my own person. Absolutely. I mean, that is part of our sinful nature is to not want to have to come to anybody and have to listen to the advice of anybody or submit to anybody. They want to just be able to do whatever they want. But we have to remember that as a body of Christ, as a wife, that is of Christ. We have to know that we are to submit to our husbands, not because we, yes, we have to, because it is commanded of us, but we do it out of love, just like Christ loved us, the church that he gave his life for us. We are to love our husbands. We are to submit to him because we love the Lord. And in loving the Lord, we love our husbands and we show our husbands Christ in doing that and I think what you pointed out at the very beginning of verse 22 submit to your own husbands as to the Lord mm -hmm. so what it's basically saying is just as you wives women just as you submit yourself to God's commands and mm -hmm. God's will and God's authority so you're supposed to submit to your husband that way mm -hmm. Absolutely. But what if he's a non-believer? I honestly, I believe that as long as your husband, who is a non-believer, is not asking you to sin, that you are to obey him because you are showing him Christ in that moment. Mm -hmm. You are showing yeah. him the love of Christ. You're mm -hmm. bringing Christ into his life. Mm-hmm. And if you rebel and you don't listen to him, then they can say, well, you're not being Christ-like. You're supposed to submit into me. The Bible said so, and you're not listening to me. Mm. And that reminds me of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 13. It says, if any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever mm -hmm. and he consents to live with her, yeah. she should not divorce him. Absolutely. For the unbelieving husband is made holy uh -huh. because of his wife. What does that mean? Does that mean that he's saved? No. So no. what does that mean? That just means that by you living with them, they are open to seeing what Christ is doing in your life. 
that you're able to show him Christ in his life. You're able to pray over him. You're able to Mm -hmm. even try and talk to them about Mm -hmm. Christ and share about Christ in their life. And and it's it's also the same way as vice versa for the other. Mm -hmm. And the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if a man out there has an unbelieving wife, he's not supposed to divorce her either Mm -hmm. if she's willing to live with him Uh um, through consent. And it says, otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. Uh Again, does that mean that automatically your children are saved? No. They're just seeing Christ work in your lives together. I mean, we never know that by us coming alongside of our husbands or our wives that are not believers that God is working in their heart and he's able to save them by seeing your actions and seeing your love towards them even while they're not saved even when they do sinful things that they shouldn't do you are still there praying for them and seeing that nothing harms them and your children are witnesses to that and they see that love that you have towards them even if they may be doing something to harm you you still love them and you still show Christ into their lives and it also says in verse 16 for how do you know wife whether you will save your husband or how do you know husband whether you will save your wife now when we got married you were a believer right Absolutely. Was I a believer? No. (laughs) Was it uh, hard? It was. It was difficult because at first I believed you to be saved. But as time went by, I just realized that you were not, in fact, saved. That you struggled. You wanted to. You kept trying to come to Christ. And Mm -hmm. it was just... It was just you trying to change and it was difficult. But as a God, God's daughter, I realized that God had put me in that position that I was there to pray for you and to um, just ask God to do something in your life. If it wouldn't have been me, then who would have done that? Amen. And also, I think uh, there's a lot of men listening right now that would say yeah the reason i came to the lord is because of a prayerful wife Mm. because of a believing wife and that's me like i was a non-believer i remember getting drunk in the living room and walking in on my wife who was on the floor praying and weeping and praising god on her keyboard and i knew she was praying for me (laughs) and it only made me more angry (laughs) and it only made me more upset and it only made me drink more And so I know what it means to be an unbelieving husband with a believing wife and how impactful it is on the conscience of the unbelieving husband for a wife who is able to love her husband the way God designed her to, even though the man is not willing to love her the way he designed him to. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think that's ultimately how we transition to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, all the way through the end of verse 33. Keeping in mind that men are, by design, created to lead their wives in authority, Mm -hmm. but in understanding, submitting himself to his wife. Mm -hmm. By submitting himself, that doesn't mean... That he's um, giving up his authority as a leader of the home to the wife. Uh Right. Yeah. So what does that mean for men to submit themselves to their wives? Well, it says in verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So just as the beginning of verse 25, it says, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Well, now husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That means he might sanctify her. That doesn't mean that she will be automatically saved, but rather in loving her, just like a woman loves her husband, a non-believing husband, and makes him holy 
So when a man loves his wife the way Christ loves the church, he is sanctifying her. In a sense, he is washing her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. And this is something that I try to practice on a daily basis with my wife. Mm-hmm. I try to talk her ear off with theology and with scripture and with uh, different ideas of, of, of the Bible. And I just love talking the word with you. And uh, I mean, you might not like talking the word with me, but <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but um, but yeah, the man is supposed to love the wife, taking his role seriously, mm-hmm. sanctifying her by washing her with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor. And so just as Christ is washing the church through the word, with the spirit, with his blood, so the man is supposed to in a sense, serve and love his wife in such a way that he sanctifies her, Mm -hmm. that he makes her pure, Mm -hmm. that he is cleansing her through his love actions, Mm -hmm. through his love words. Mm -hmm. And so when when he goes on to say, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish in the same way. In the same way that Christ does all those things, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. Mm -hmm. And I know some of you guys out there really love your own bodies. (laughs) You guys take care of your own bodies. You guys go to the gym and work out. You guys eat right. Just as much as you take care of your own body, take care of your wives that way. He who loves his wife loves himself. Mm -hmm. It's such a beautiful thing to say because the world wants to say, no, love yourself first Mm -hmm. and then you can learn to love others. And it's like nobody loves you more than yourself. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Nobody knows how to love you more than you know how to love yourself. Mm -hmm. But once you learn how to love your wife, guess what? By loving your wife, you're loving yourself. Yeah. Because... When you marry her, you become one flesh. Mm -hmm. And by becoming one flesh, whatever you do to her is what you do for yourself. Mm -hmm. So in serving her, you are actually serving yourself. I know it's the craziest thing to think of. And it might seem odd to say that. Mm -hmm. But when you look at your wife as the jewel of your life, then you will want to treasure her as much as you want. In verse 29, it says... For no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. And that's that's an incredible statement. I think a lot of people run over that is Mm -hmm. if you hated your own flesh, you would starve to death. Basically, you would never bathe. You wouldn't brush your teeth. You wouldn't (laughs) come here. You wouldn't do anything to yourself. You just let yourself rot away if you really didn't love yourself. But nobody has ever hated himself that much. No. You know, I know that there's those that take their own lives. Um, but most of the time they do that because of a small instance of depression or, you know, some kind of evil. But nobody ever hated themselves to starve themselves no. to death or never take care of themselves. I don't think anything remotely close to that has ever happened. No. Not purposely, purposefully no. anyways. You know, there's, there have been those prisoners of war and stuff that yeah. <laughs> go through malnourishment and stuff. But anyways, so let's get back to it. Um, no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However... Let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So that is how we are to submit to one another. We are to submit in such a way that men love their wives as they love their own bodies, as Christ loved the church. And women are supposed to submit to their husbands and respect the authority of their husbands, Mm -hmm. just as they do with Christ. Now, the last bit of scriptures we want to read is First Peter chapter 3, and this is more geared towards women this time. So I'll have Princess, my wife, 
continue reading at verse 1 of first peter chapter 3 it says likewise wives be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word they may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives understand that there are times when we have ungodly husbands and they are not willing to hear what you have to say about god they don't want anything to do with it. But by the change in your actions, by the change in the way that you treat them, they will see that Christ is living through you, that there is something different mm. and something about you that they are attracted to and they will want. Mm. And that is Christ. That is you showing Christ in them. It goes on to say, when they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of your hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty and a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. That's, I think that's so important because um, I, th I think a lot of the time, Women want to feel um, beautiful, but only by the externals. Mm -hmm. So what is Peter trying to say here? Does it mean you shouldn't wear jewelry or clothing or braid your hair or anything like that? Absolutely not. There is nothing wrong with wanting to look nice for our husbands. If anything, it's a good thing because that is one way to show them that you love them is by getting ready for them and making yourself look beautiful. But what is trying to say there is that what is most important is your actions, your words, how you speak to your husband, how you act with your husband, how you treat them. Do you, do you treat them with respect? Are you loving towards them? Those are the things that they're going to notice. That when it says in verse 4, let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable, be imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that you're supposed to go around the house silent and not answering and not having an opinion or a voice or anything like that? No, it just means that when there comes a time that you are having arguments instead of arguing back or instead of being spiteful or getting angry, just be quiet. Be quiet and allow them to see Christ through you. Allow them to see that you are not that same person anymore. That arguing with them and fighting with them is not something that you want to do. It goes on to say, For this is how the holy woman who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Now, some people might ask, how are we Sarah's children if we're not Hebrews, if we're not Jews? What does that mean to be Sarah's children? It means that by being the children of Christ, that we come from that lineage of Abraham and Sarah. They are the father, well, he is the father of the faith. And her being his wife makes her our mother of faith, basically. So we are her spiritual children. Yeah, and I think... Um I think that's an important thing to say because we recognize that we as Christians are also um, part of the lineage of Abraham, but not of blood, but of faith. Absolutely. And so, um, and the interesting thing is Abraham lived um, in, in an understanding way towards his wife also. Yeah. When Sarah asked Abraham to get rid of the slave in Ishmael, uh -huh. God told him, heed the voice of your wife because she is the woman of the promise uh -huh. and not this woman and not Ishmael. And so in heeding and understanding his wife, he also acted in 
a sense, submission to her uh-huh. by heeding the voice of his wife. And that's why he goes on to say in verse 7, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Amen. So just as women submit to their husbands, now, you, does that mean we, that w- all the women should call their husbands Lord? No. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one Lord, and that is Jesus Christ. Right. Well, I mean, in this context, what it means is like, yes, sir, is basically. Absolutely. Like, um, does that mean every woman out there should say yes, sir, to her husband? or uh-huh. Yes, dear, or um, not have questions or opinions or anything like that? No. I mean, you, you're you always able to have your opinions as long as in the end you're able to come with your husband also in understanding and you guys are able to come up with a decision together. Amen. And I think as we finish up, uh, this is one of the last verses I'll share. Verse 7, finish out. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Now, that doesn't mean that she's not intelligent, that she doesn't have opinions, or that she's she can't be right. Guess what, guys? Most of the time, they're right. <laughs> so, um, we need to show honor to her in recognizing that our strength is not meant to try to overpower her in things, but rather our strength is supposed to be used to serve her because we recognize that physically she is the weaker vessel Mm -hmm. and that God designed us to submit our strength to our wives. And that's how I think we show honor to the weaker vessel is by submitting our strength, our bodies to them. It says, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. I think this is so important. Our wives are daughters of the high king of the universe. Mm-hmm. They are all princesses. <laughs> My wife's name is really princess, but all of them are princesses of the king. And we are to serve them. We are to honor them. We are to bless them. Why? And it finishes out saying, so that your prayers may not be hindered, which is crazy to think yeah. that depending on how I treat my wife Absolutely. is whether or not my prayers will be heeded by God or uh-huh. heard and answered by God. And I think that's something we ought to take greatly into consideration as men. Are we treating our wives in such a way that when the father looks at his princesses being treated harshly by their husbands, why would we assume that if we are harsh to them, that our heavenly father would want to listen to us? Mm-hmm. If we cannot even treat his own daughters rightly. I have a daughter. And if a man comes and treats her harshly and then asks and requests something from me, why would he assume that I would listen to him for even the slightest of a second? Yeah. I think that is so beautiful because as we are seeing, you know, we know that as women, God is calling us to submit unto our husbands but here God is telling us I still love you and I still want to protect you and if your husbands are not treating you well they're not treating you the way you're supposed to be I'm not going to listen to them amen so I thank you very much thank you babe for being on here again with me um I pray that this small, well, actually, this is a pretty long message going on 50 minutes now. I didn't think we can go that long. But um, this is, I think, an excellent um, segment on reform perspective. I pray that this message has been a blessing to you. I hit the subscribe button below. List any comments or questions on my YouTube channel. Um, I really do like doing these videos with you. <laughs> this last one that we did, we did on sex. And the blessings of sex. So if you want to listen to that, go to my YouTube channel and check it out. Maybe you uh, will be blessed by that message too. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Amen. I love you. Love you too. All right. God bless you guys. And until next time, join us on uh, Reform Perspective.